Australopithecines, our ancient relatives who once roamed the savannah, woodlands, and forests of ancient Africa. From the shadows of prehistory emerges a narrative of resilience, adaptation, and the roots of humanity. From the iconic Lucy to the mysterious Australopithecus Sediba. This is not just a story, it's a journey that connects us to the very essence of our existence. Welcome to the untold saga of the Australopithecines. The term Australopithecine came from a former classification as members of a distinct subfamily, the Australopithecini. Members of Australopithecus are sometimes referred to as the gracile Australopiths, while Paranthropus are called the robust Australopiths. In this video, I will focus on just the so-called gracile Australopiths, and I will do it in chronological order, from the oldest Australopithecus to the youngest. But as some reigned longer than others, and some overlapped and coexisted at the same time, it will be from when they first evolved. So, first up, is the oldest known Australopithecus species, called Australopithecus anamensis, who lived during the Pleistocene era, between 4.2 and 3.8 million years ago. Nearly 100 fossil specimens of anamensis are known from Kenya and Ethiopia, representing over 20 individuals. The first fossils of anamensis were found in 1965 in Kanapoi and Alia Bay in northern Kenya by a research team led by Brian Patterson from Harvard University, who discovered just a single arm bone. But Patterson could not confidently identify the species to which it belonged. It wasn't until 1994, when a research team led by paleoanthropologist Meeve Leakey, who found numerous teeth and fragments of bone at the same site. Leakey and her colleagues determined that the fossils were those of a very primitive hominin, and they named the new species Australopithecus anamensis. Although considered to be the more primitive of the Australopiths, anamensis had parts of the knee, tibia, and elbow that were different from apes, which indicates bipedalism as the species' form of locomotion. Specifically, the tibia bone of anamensis has a more expansive upper end with bone. In addition to the modified body parts that indicate bipedalism, anamensis fossils also show evidence of tree climbing. Archaeology finds indicate that anamensis had long forearms, as well as modified features of the wrist bone. Both the forearms and finger bones of anamensis indicate a potential of utilizing the upper limbs as support when operating in trees or on the ground. Forearm bones belonging to anamensis have been found to be 265 mm to 277 mm in length. The curved proximal hand phalanx of anamensis in the fossil record that contains strong ridges is indicative of its potential ability to climb. The cranium combines some more ancestral features, such as a protruding face and a long and narrow brain case. But they also had a somewhat wide jaw joint that was flat from front to back, which resembles a curvature similar to those seen in great apes. Based on partial skulls discovered, Anamensis had a relatively small brain of about 370 cubic centimetres, which is smaller than all later Australopiths, and slightly lower than the average chimpanzee today. Furthermore, the ear canal of Anamensis fossils are narrow in diameter. The ear canal most resembles that of chimpanzees, and is contrasting to the wide ear canals of both later Australopithecus and Homo. The first lower premolar of Anamensis is characterized by a singular large cusp. Additionally, Anamensis has a narrow first milk molar that contains a large dominant cusp with minimum surface area, which may have been used for crushing. Based on fossil evidence, Anamensis expresses high degrees of sexual dimorphism, which means the males were significantly larger than the females. The differences between males and females are often linked to the competitive nature of mating and establishing dominance within social structures, just like the apes of today. Plant and animal fossils and the analysis of ancient sediments and rocks provide clues about this species' environment. They lived near an ancient inland lake that existed in the basin where Lake Tucana is now found. The region was subject to volcanic activity and various volcanic eruptions produced layers of volcanic ash that covered the ground. 
The fossilized remains of this species were found trapped between different layers of ash, and this has enabled this species' fossils to be reliably dated to between 3.8 and 4.2 million years in age. These early ancestors lived in forests and woodlands that grew near the lake. Their skeletons show that they walked on two legs when on the ground, and they probably spent a lot of time climbing trees, perhaps searching for food or avoiding predators. Their teeth indicate they were plant eaters, eating both fruits and hard-to-chew foods, such as nuts. No evidence of culture has been found yet for Australopithecus anamensis, but it may have used simple tools similar to those used by modern chimpanzees, including twigs, sticks and other plant materials that were easily shaped or modified. These may have been used for a variety of simple tasks, including obtaining food. Next in line, we have the more well-known Australopithecus afarensis, which some of you will be familiar with, as it is the species that the famous Lucy is assigned to. Lucy is a collection of several hundred pieces of fossilized bone, comprising 40% of the skeleton of a female, discovered in 1974 in Ethiopia, at Hadar, a site in the Awash Valley of the Afar Triangle, by paleontologist Donald Johansson. Lucy is famous because her discovery provided crucial insights into human evolution. She's one of the most complete ancient hominid fossils and offers a glimpse into early bipedalism, a significant step in human evolution. Australopithecus afarensis lived from about 3.9 to 2.9 million years ago in the Pliocene of East Africa. They are one of the longest lived and best known early human species Paleoanthropologists have uncovered remains of more than 300 individuals. This species survived for more than 900,000 years, which is around four times as long as our own species has been around. Afarensis had a tall face, a delicate brow ridge, a robust jaw, and prognathism, which means the jaw jutted outwards, similar to that of gorillas. The brain of Afarensis was about one-third the size of the average modern human brain, averaging approximately 430 cubic centimeters, about the same size as a modern ape's brain. But larger than Australopithecus anamensis's brain who came before them. Reorganization of the brain may have begun with some enlargement to parts of the cerebral cortex, indicating an increase in intelligence compared to their ancestors. The presence of a small hyoid bone, which helps anchor the tongue and voice box, was found in a juvenile specimen suggests afarensis had a chimp-like voice box, probably unable to possess human-like speech. Males and females varied significantly in body size, with males standing approximately 4 feet 11 inches tall and weighing 100 pounds, and females standing about 3 feet 5 inches tall and weighing about 62 pounds. Males also typically had large crests on top of their skulls, Females did not. The leg bones as well as some 3.6 million year old footprints made by Afarensis in Laetoli, Tanzania, suggest that Afarensis was a competent biped, though somewhat less efficient at walking than humans. The arm and shoulder bones have some similar aspects to those of orangutans and gorillas, which has variously been interpreted as either evidence of partial tree-dwelling arboreality or basal traits inherited from the chimpanzee-human last common ancestor, with no adaptive functionality. Similar to chimpanzees, Afarensis children grew rapidly after birth and reached adulthood earlier than modern humans. This meant Afarensis had a shorter period of growing up than modern humans have today, leaving them less time for parental guidance and socialization during childhood. Afarensis appears to have inhabited a wide range of habitats with no real preference, inhabiting open grasslands or woodlands, shrublands, and lake or riverside forests. Afarensis was probably a generalist omnivore of both C3 forest plants, which could have been fruits like figs, wild cherries, also alders, flowers, and so on, and C4 cam savanna plants, which include grasses, seeds, roots, underground storage organs, succulents, and perhaps creatures which ate those, such as termites. Carbon isotope analysis on teeth from specimens named Hadar and Dikika, 3.4 to 2.9 million years ago, 
suggests a widely ranging diet between different specimens, with forest-dwelling specimens showing a preference for C3 forest plants and bush or grassland-dwelling specimens, a preference for C4 cam savanna plants. Thus, Afarensis appears to have been capable of exploiting a variety of food resources in a wide range of habitats. The dental anatomy of Afarensis is ideal for consuming hard, brittle foods, but micro-wearing patterns on the molars suggest that such foods were infrequently consumed, probably as fallback items in leaner times. Fossil animal bones with cut marks found in Dikika in 2010 have been attributed to this species, suggesting they may have included significant amounts of meat in their diets. They had a big cone-shaped rib cage, which indicates they had large bellies adapted to a relatively low quality and high bulk diet. The position of the sagittal crest toward the back of the skull indicates that the front teeth processed most of the food. Afarensis probably used simple tools that may have included sticks and other non-durable plant materials found in the immediate surroundings. As mentioned earlier, fossil bones bearing cut marks were found in Dikika in Ethiopia, dating to about 3.4 million years old. These bones show clear evidence of stone tools being used to remove flesh and to possibly smash bone in order to obtain marrow. No actual tools were found, so it is not known whether the tools were deliberately modified or just usefully shaped stones. Stones may also have been used as tools, but there is no evidence that stones were shaped or modified in any way. It seems likely that they lived in small social groups containing a mixture of males and females, children and adults. Females were much smaller than males, again displaying sexual dimorphism, as in all other Australopithecines. Next up is Australopithecus Barrel Ghazali, discovered in 1995 at Coro Toro, Bahar El Ghazel, Chad, by a Franco-Chadian team led by paleontologist Michel Brunet. They existed around 3.5 million years ago during the Pliocene. Although the full extent of its reign is unknown due to limited fossils, it is the first and only Australopithecine known from Central Africa and demonstrates that this group was widely distributed across Africa as opposed to being restricted to East and Southern Africa as previously thought. Not too much is known about Bahrel Ghazali as it is only identified from three partial jaw bones and an isolated premolar. The teeth on this jawbone are quite similar to the jawbone of Afarensis with large and incisor-like canines and bicuspid premolars. The lack of cranial remains makes estimates difficult, but the similarities in jaw and teeth features to other Australopithecines suggest the brain would be in the same size range, 400 to 550 cubic centimeters, as other species in the genus. One difference between Bahrel Ghazali and other Australopithecines is its relatively vertical chin, in comparison, although it is still receding, this trait more resembles Homo than other Australopithecines. This species live in a lakeside environment surrounded by forests, wooded savanna, and open grassy patches. Carbon isotope analysis indicates a diet of predominantly C4 savanna foods, such as grasses, sedges, underground storage organs, or rhizomes. There is a smaller C3 portion which may have comprised more typical ape food items, such as fruits, flowers, pods, or insects. This indicates that, like contemporary and future Australopiths, Barel Ghazali was capable of exploiting whatever food was abundant in its environment. There is no evidence for any specific cultural attributes, but it may have behaved in a manner similar to other Australopithecines living in Africa at the same time. It probably used simple tools that included sticks and other non-durable plant materials found in the immediate surroundings. Stones may also have been used as tools, but there is no evidence that stones were shaped or modified in any way. It seems likely that they lived in small social groups containing a mixture of males and females, children and adults. A lot more archaeological finds are needed to know more about this species. Hopefully more findings can be made in the future to deepen our understanding on Bahrel Ghazali. During around the same time as Afarensis and Bahrel Ghazali, we have the slightly controversial Australopithecus deiremida, which is an extinct species of Australopithecine from Waranso Mil 
a far region Ethiopia, from about 3.5 to 3.3 million years ago during the Pliocene. It was named in 2015 based on the upper and lower jaw fossils discovered in the Afar region of Ethiopia. The holotype of Deiremida is an upper jaw with teeth. The paratypes are two lower jaws and a small fragment of the upper jaw. Because it is known only from three partial jaw bones, it is unclear if these specimens indeed represent a unique species or belong to the much better known Australopithecus afarensis, hence the controversy. But paleontologists believe the remains are distinct enough from the contemporary and the well-known Australopithecus afarensis to warrant species distinction, and Deiremida is counted among a growing diversity of late Pliocene Australopithecines. Australopithecus Deiremida is distinguished from the contemporaneous Australopithecus afarensis by the shape and size of its thick enameled teeth, more anteriorly positioned origin of the cheekbones and the robust architecture of its lower jaws. The anterior teeth are also relatively small, indicating that it probably had a different diet. Because of Deiremida, strong jawbone and thick enamel, this indicates a diet of tough sedges and similar foods, which Australopiths are generally thought to have primarily subsisted upon. Deiremida and Afarensis may have exhibited niche partitioning, given they cohabited the same area. Niche partitioning refers to the process by which competing species use the environment differently in a way that helps them to coexist. That is, given dental and chewing differences, they may have had different dietary and habitat preferences unless these differences were simply a product of genetic drift. Much like chimpanzees and gorillas which have more or less the same diet and inhabit the same areas, Deiremida and Afarensis may have shared typical foods when in abundance and resorted to different fallback foods in times of food scarcity. No evidence for tool use is seen, but like all other Australopithecines, they most likely used or made stone tools. Next up we have Australopithecus africanus, who lived between about 3.3 and 2.1 million years ago in the late Pliocene to early Pleistocene of South Africa. This species was the first of our pre-human ancestors to be discovered, but was initially rejected from our family tree because of its small brain. In 1924, a fossil was rescued from a limestone quarry at Taung in South Africa and sent to Australian Raymond Dart, who was a professor of anatomy in nearby Johannesburg. The now famous Taung child skull had a mixture of human-like and ape-like features. Dart believed it to be an early ancestor of humans, and in 1925 he gave his man-ape a new species name, Australopithecus africanus. Dart had difficulty convincing other scientists that this was a human ancestor, partly because at the time, many believed human ancestors had large brains and ape-like jaws, whereas the town child had the opposite set of features. Acceptance only arose in the late 1940s, after Robert Broom's discoveries of more fossils, including those of adults. Since then, many hundreds of Australopithecus africanus fossils have been found in South Africa. A specimen named Little Foot is the most complete preserved early hominin, with 90% of the skeleton intact and the oldest South African Australopith. Africanus's brain volume averaged approximately 480 cubic centimeters, relatively large when compared with a modern chimpanzee's brain, and the earliest Australopiths like Anamensis. Like other early hominins, the cheek teeth were enlarged and had thick enamel. Male skulls may have been more robust than female skulls. Males were on average 4 feet 7 inches in height and 40 kilograms in weight, and females 4 feet 1 inches and 30 kilograms. Africanus was a competent biped, albeit less efficient at walking than humans. Africanus also had several upper body traits in common with arboreal non-human apes. This is variously interpreted as either evidence of a partially or fully arboreal lifestyle or as a non-functional vestige from a more ape-like ancestor. The upper body of Africanus is more ape-like than that of the East African Australopithecus afarensis. The atlas bone in the neck, important for swiveling and stabilizing the head, is more similar to non-human apes, 
and indicates greater mobility to swivel up and down than in humans. Such motion is important for arboreal species to locate and focus on climbable surfaces. A specimen named STW573 shows similar mechanical advantages for the muscles which move the shoulder girdle as chimps and gorillas, which may indicate less lordosis, which is the normal curvature of the spine in the Africanus neck vertebrae. However, a later specimen named STW679 has some similarities to human atlases, which could potentially indicate gradual evolution away from the ape condition. The Africanus hand and arm exhibit a mosaic anatomy, with some aspects more similar to humans and others to non-human apes. It is unclear if this means Australopiths were still arboreal to a degree, or if these traits were simply inherited from the human chimpanzee last common ancestor. Nonetheless, Africanus exhibits a more ape-like upper limb anatomy than Afarensis, and is typically interpreted as having been to some extent arboreal. Like in arboreal primates, the fingers are curved, the arms relatively long, and the shoulders are in a shrugging position. The Africanus shoulder is most like that of orangutans, and well suited for maintaining stability and bearing weight while raised and placed overhead. Africanus arm bones are consistent with powerful muscles useful in climbing. Nonetheless, the brachial index, which is the forearm to humerus ratio, is 82.8 to 86.2, which is perfectly midway between chimpanzees and humans. The thumb and wrist indicate human-like functionality, with a precision grip and forceful opposition between the thumb and fingers. The adoption of such a grip is typically interpreted as an adaptation for tool-making at the expense of efficient climbing and arboreal habitation. The leg bones clearly show that Africanus habitually engaged in bipedal locomotion, though some aspects of the tibiae are ape-like, which could indicate that the leg musculature had not been fully reorganized into the human condition. If correct, its functional implications are unclear. The trabecular bone at the hip joint is distinctly human-like, which would be inconsistent with the great degrees of hip loading required in prolonged arboreal activity. The tibia met the foot at a similar angle as it does in humans, which is necessary for habitual bipedalism, Consequently, the ankle was not as adept for climbing activities as it is in non-human apes. However, astonishingly, the modern Congo Twa hunter-gatherers can achieve a chimp-like angle with the ankle while climbing trees due to the longer fibers in the calf muscle instead of specific skeletal adaptations, showcasing the complexity of adaptations in different hominid lineages. The Africanus foot is human-like with a stiff midfoot and lack of a mid-tarsal break, which allows non-human apes to lift the heel independently from the rest of the foot. Though Africanus did not have a dexterous big toe like humans, Africanus likely did not push off with the big toe, using the side of the foot instead. The group dynamics of Australopithecines is difficult to predict with any degree of accuracy. A 2011 strontium isotope study of Africanus teeth from the Dolomite Sterkfontein Valley found that, assuming that especially small teeth represented female specimens and especially large teeth males, females were more likely to leave their place of birth, to mate with others outside of her familial group, similar to modern chimpanzee females. This species occupied an environment in South Africa in which there was a mixture of woodland and savanna grassland. After 2.5 million years ago, the climate became drier and savanna grasslands spread. Analysis of tooth wear patterns suggests that Australopithecus africanus had a diet that included fruit and leaves. Carbon isotope analyses indicate they ate a notable amount of C4 savanna plants, such as grasses, seeds, rhizomes, underground storage organs, or perhaps grass-eating invertebrates, such as locusts or termites. Chemical analysis of the teeth also suggests that some meat was included in the diet, but not in significant amounts. It is likely that they may have scavenged for meat rather than hunted. This species probably used simple tools, such as sticks found in the immediate surroundings, and scavenged animal bones. Stones may also have been used as tools, however. There is no evidence that these stones were shaped or modified. 
Up next is Australopithecus garhi. The fossils found of this species are dated to 2.5 million years old, but it is unclear how far they reigned, as there is little fossil evidence for garhi, and more fossils need to be found in order for a species time range to be determined. The fossils are significant as they help fill the period between 2 and 3 million years ago, a time with a poor human fossil record. The first findings was a partial cranium discovered in 1997 by Johannes Haile Selassie in Bori, Ethiopia. A second cranium, lower jaws and a partial skeleton have been found at nearby sites. Like F approximately 450 cubic centimeters, a jaw which jutted out, a sagittal crest running along the midline of the skull, relatively large molars and premolars. And it is possible that though unclear if, males were larger than females exhibited. One individual, a presumed female based on size, may have been four feet seven inches tall. But more fossils are needed to determine if they were sexually dimorphic, it is very likely they were, like all other Australopithecines. Like the earlier Australopithecus afarensis from the same region, Gari had a human-like humerus to femur ratio, but an ape-like brachial index, which means lower to upper arm ratio, as well as curved phalanges of the hand. This is generally interpreted as adaptations for both habitual bipedalism, which means walking on two legs, as well as for arboreality, in other words, for grasping while climbing in trees. Although similar to other Australopithecines, it displayed some surprising features. The legs of Garhi are elongated, unlike those of other Australopithecus, and in humans, elongated limbs develop during the delayed adolescent growth spurt. This could mean that Garhi, compared to other Australopithecus, either had a slower overall growth rate or a more rapid leg growth rate. This also suggests a change toward longer strides during bipedal walking. A changing climate had thinned the forests that once dominated this region, and savanna grasslands were becoming widespread. Fossils of Australopithecus garhi are associated with some of the oldest known stone tools, along with animal bones that were cut and broken open with stone tools. It is possible then that this species was among the first to make the transition to stone tool making and to eating meat and bone marrow from large animals though it was not found directly with any tools. Mammalian bones associated with the Gahi remains exhibit cut and percussion marks made from stone tools. The left mandible of an Alcilopine bovid, with three successive unambiguous cut marks, presumably made while removing the tongue. A bovid tibia with cut marks, chop marks, and impact scars from a hammerstone, possibly inflicted to harvest the bone marrow and a horse femur with cut marks consistent with dismemberment and filleting. It is possible these hominins were creating and carrying tools some ways with them to butchering sites, intending to use them many times before discarding. It was previously believed that only Homo could manufacture tools. And finally, they last Australopithecus to live, Australopithecus sediba. The discoveries of sediba have come from Malapa Cave, cradle of humankind, South Africa. It is known from a partial juvenile skeleton, the holotype MH1, and a partial adult female skeleton, the paratype MH2. This fossils of this species date to between 1.95 to 1.78 million years ago. This does not represent the time span for this species, merely a point in time for a limited number of fossils. Sediba coexisted with both Paranthropus robustus and Homo erectus. The fossil skeletons of Sediba from Malapa Cave are so complete that scientists can see what entire skeletons looked like near the time when Homo evolved. Details of the teeth, the length of the arms and legs, and the narrow upper chest resemble earlier Australopithecus, while other tooth traits and the broad lower chest resemble humans. These links indicate that Sediba may reveal information about the origins and ancestor of the genus Homo. Functional changes in the pelvis of Sediba point to the evolution of upright walking, while other parts of the skeleton retain features found in other Australopithecines. 
Measurements of the strength of the humerus and femur show that Sediba had a more human-like pattern of locomotion than a fossil attributed to Homo habilis. These features suggest that Sediba walked upright on a regular basis, and that changes in the pelvis occurred before other changes in the body that are found in later specimens of Homo. The Australopithecus Sediba skull has several derived features, such as relatively small premolars and molars, and facial features that are more similar to those in Homo, such as minimal cresting compared to earlier Australopithecines. The face of a Sediba specimen named MH1 is strikingly similar to Homo instead of other Australopithecines, with a less pronounced brow ridge, cheekbones, and prognathism, the amount the face that juts out, and there is evidence of a slight chin. However, such characteristics could be due to juvenility and lost with maturity. Despite these changes in the pelvis and skull, other parts of Sediba skeleton shows a body similar to that of other Australopithecines, with long upper limbs and a small cranial capacity. The fossils also show that changes in the pelvis and the dentition occurred before changes in limb proportions or cranial capacity. Sediba was similar to other Australopithecines in body size and shape. They had a brain volume of about 420 to 440 cubic centimeters, similar to other Australopithecines. But shapes of the right and left brain halves was uneven, only seen in Homo, and unlike in other Australopithecines. Judging by fossil evidence, they have been estimated to be around 4 feet 3 to 5 feet 1 inches tall and weighed around 30 to 36 kilograms. Like I mentioned earlier, their limbs were primitive and similar to other Australopithecines, including relatively long upper limbs with large joint surfaces, a retention of primitive features on their upper and lower limbs. Their foot bones were primitive and their hands were curved like other Australopithecines. They had a similar pelvis to other Australopithecines, but with derived features in the ileum that anticipate the reorganization of the pelvis and limbs as seen in later Homo erectus. The combination of primitive and derived traits in Australopithecus sediba shows part of the transition from a form adapted to partial arboreality to one primarily adapted to bipedal walking. But the legs and feet point to a previously unknown way of walking upright. With each step, Australopithecus sediba turned its foot inward with its weight focused on the outer edge of the foot. This odd way of striding may mean that upright walking evolved on more than one path during human evolution. The woodland environment of South Africa started to dry out about 2.5 million years ago, leading to the spread of savanna grasslands. Sediba lived in a generally flat landscape with a patchwork of grasslands and woods. Numerous bones of other animals were found in the cave deposits, including saber-toothed cats. Although no detailed analysis has as yet been carried out on toothware or isotopes, it is likely that it ate fleshy fruits, young leaves and perhaps small mammals or lizards. There is no evidence of tool use or any other cultural elements. It is likely that this species lived in a manner similar to Africanus and was adapted to a similar ecological niche. It probably used simple tools, such as sticks, found in the immediate surroundings and scavenged animal bones. Stones may also have been used as tools. However, there is no evidence that these stones were shaped or modified. And that's all the gracile Australopiths known to date. Anamensis, Afarensis, Deiramada, Bahrel Ghazali, Africanus, Garhi and Sediba. Australopithecines are believed to have evolved from earlier hominins, possibly Ardipithecus, the earliest known genus of the zoological family, Hominidae, the group that includes humans and excludes great apes, that lived during the late Miocene and early Pliocene epochs in the Afar Depression, Ethiopia. Ardipithecus displayed a mix of primitive and more derived features, such as that it exhibited evidence of both tree-climbing adaptations and bipedalism, and it fed both on trees and on the ground in a more open habitat, unlike chimpanzees, suggesting a transitional phase from arboreal to terrestrial habits, a good indicator of transitioning from a chimp-like ape to a human-like ape. 
but the precise evolutionary lineage is still an area of ongoing research and discovery in paleoanthropology. The transition from more ape-like ancestors to Australopithecines marked a critical phase in the evolution of hominins, eventually leading to the emergence of the genus Homo, which includes us, modern humans. The Australopithecines represent various stages in human evolution. They are considered distant ancestors in our evolutionary lineage, showcasing traits that hint at the transition from ape-like ancestors to the emergence of Homo species, including Homo sapiens. These species provide crucial insights into our evolutionary history, demonstrating the gradual development of traits that define us, modern humans. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Goodbye.